Throughout the world, we all seem to value reason and knowledge, and just being smart to keep it casual. What follows is that we tend to run away from stupidity, foolishness, and folly. I mean, you don't want to be that person in class that doesn't know the answer. You want to ace that answer so you could totally impress, well, no one. Because honestly, no one will remember someone getting an answer right once class is over. But despite this love for knowledge and reason, are we possibly overlooking some importance of foolishness or folly for the purposes of this video? I mean, we're all familiar with the phrase, ignorance is bliss. So there is that emotional benefit of folly, but is there anything more? Well thankfully, the Renaissance philosopher Desiderius Erasmus has a whole book on the ways folly can be beneficial. Now this text suffers from the prince problem, where it may be read as satire, but regardless, I think the text still offers some takeaways outside of a satirical context. This book is unsurprisingly named The Praise of Folly, and although short, new justifications for folly spring out on each page. Today we're going to be looking at one of those justifications, folly as an element of social cohesion. Hello and welcome back to Philosophy Tunes, the channel that didn't fake the moon landing, but faked the existence of space itself. Oh, and before I forget, I should mention that I'm using the Hoyt Hopewell Hudson version of this text, which will be linked below. Now this idea that folly or foolishness somehow adds to social cohesion seems like a pretty bold assertion. I mean, isn't it the other way around? Doesn't foolishness add to social conflict, while reason comes swooping in to save the day? Well, it is a pretty tough position to take, but by the end of this video, I will have hopefully conveyed a fairly decent argument in its favor. Quick disclaimer before we start, Erasmus writes the book from the perspective of Folly, who he portrays as a woman in your classic jester outfit, but probably not looking like this. So when the quotes I use are in the first person, it is Folly that's speaking. So let's start here. Let's start with the idea that society is composed of relationships between individuals. Seems fine enough. Maybe some big brain sociologist might disagree, who knows? I didn't take sociology. I majored in a somehow less employable field. But if you accept this premise, let's take a look at some of these relationships. Erasmus, or folly I guess, starts by looking at friendships. Yet there are others, perhaps, who find satisfaction in the love and familiar society of friends, letting it be known that friendship uniquely deserved to be preferred above all else. And I mean, we don't really have to get super in-depth as to why friends are good, do we? I feel like it's a pretty obvious sentiment. But how does folly play into all of this? Conniving at your friend's vices, passing them over, being blind to them, and deceived by them, even loving and admiring your friend's egregious faults as if they were virtues. Does not this seem pretty close to folly? So all of our friends have faults, right? But the fact that we're friends with them means that we overlook those flaws in favor of their friendship. Because look, nobody's perfect and everyone's gonna make mistakes. You aren't gonna vibe 100% with someone. If you drew attention to all of the faults that your friend has, you probably aren't even gonna end up as friends at the end of the day. So this is where foolishness comes into play. It seems like Erasmus is equating foolishness with overlooking. By overlooking those faults in your friends, you play the fool, so to speak. However, it is debatable whether we should really classify this overlooking as foolishness. What do you think? Regardless, that seems to be Erasmus's perspective. Now it's worth noting that we sometimes don't overlook the fault in our friends. Sometimes their faults are so significant that they demand attention. Like if your friend is doing some psycho stuff like killing kittens, you aren't just gonna overlook that. At least I hope you wouldn't. In this sense, we could think about faults in our friends on a spectrum. Some faults are small, like how they make a really annoying sound while chewing gum. You could overlook that. But the fact that they put you down or are self-destructive, maybe that calls for some attention. The question then is where do we draw the line? At what point does a fault deserve attention? I think it's a subjective determination that looks at whether or not this fault makes you reconsider your friendship with that person. When your entire friendship is being questioned by this fault, perhaps that's an indication that you should be taking it seriously. But getting back to the text, bottom line is that Erasmus believes that foolishness helps us overlook these flaws in our friends, which in turn helps us to maintain those friendships. Since then, the nature of man is such that one can discover no constitution which is not liable to great faults, and add to this all the great diversity of ages and of education, all the slips, all the mistakes, all the accidents of mortal life. How can the pleasure of friendship subsist for an hour, unless it is attended by that which you may translate as folly? The other thing to keep in mind is that we aren't going to go full folly or full reasonableness in our friendships. 
It's obviously going to be a mix of sorts, but we just tend to overlook the former. And I mean, no one is fully reasonable or fully foolish. That is, unless you live in Portland, Oregon. Now Erasmus is going to take this further. We've established that folly helps us with friendships, but why would a marriage be any different? Wouldn't folly also help us overlook the flaws in our partner and therefore keep the marriage alive? What divorces, or worse things, would not happen all over the place were not the domestic association of man and woman propped up and fostered by flattery, by jesting, by pliableness, ignorance, dissimulation, satellites of mind, remember? Now I don't need to repeat myself on the reasoning here. The same thing with friendship applies to marriage. But why stop there? Why not apply this reasoning to all social relationships? Why not apply this to father and son, teacher and student, writer and reader, employee and employer? In all types of relationships, I think it's a bit unrealistic to imagine that each party will find nothing at all disagreeable about the other person. There's always gotta be something. I mean sure, you get the honeymoon phase and sometimes when you have a crush you get into idolization mode. But once you spend enough time with a person, eventually their flaws start showing. But thankfully, folly or this overlooking is there to help maintain that relationship. So this is kind of what I meant at the beginning of this video when I said that folly contributes to social cohesion. Because if we understand society to be made up of these smaller relationships, and if we accept the position that folly contributes to maintaining these relationships, then folly in turn contributes to maintaining society. So what do you think about this specific praise of folly? Agree, disagree, comment below and let us know. If you enjoyed the video then consider subscribing, liking, and hitting the bell. And with that I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.